Good morning and welcome to Travis. We are so excited that you are tuned in with us today. Hey, if you're a guest with us, we would just simply invite you to send us an email. Uh, we would love to connect with you. And then also, Sunday, June 7, next Sunday, we're excited to uh, be gathering together again here at Travis. And hey, if this is you, we simply want to invite you to you know, practice all the guidelines that the CDC recommends, a safe social distancing, bring a face mask, all of that. We'll all be, you know, wearing one together. And uh, also, if this is not your Sunday to be back with us in person on June 7th, that is okay. We've got you covered. Uh, we want to invite you to take part of our live stream. You can take advantage of being a part of the live stream services at travis.org slash services. Again, so glad that we're here with us online today. We can't wait to see some of you in person next Sunday. But for now, let's just worship the Lord together. There's a song in my soul And I feel it stirring I know for sure That your love is like a flood And your mercy never ending I give my song to you There's a joy in my soul And it rises like the moon 
good morning, Travis family. I am so excited to be with you this morning, um, primarily from the standpoint of this is the last official sun Sunday that I have to do this. I, Man, I miss uh, being in a room with so many of you. Um, preaching to me is one of those things where it is a communal uh, thing that happens, I believe, in the New Testament. Um, and, and being able to feed off of interactions and the amens, maybe the boos from time to time or the facial expressions, uh, I, I just miss that. And I long for next week when, when we do get to gather again. Um, I want to say a couple of things that I know Matt has addressed that during the welcome. And I want to say just a couple of things to you as your pastor. Um, I, uh, I've been talking with a variety of people from our church, and I know that uh, most of you guys are going to stay home uh, next week. And then I know that there are some of you that are just eager as you can be to be back up here and to be with one another. Um, and I guess my challenge to us as a church is this, is that one of our core values is that we want to practice unity in our deci decision making and how we walk with one another. And I want you to uh, to feel the freedom to either come and, and make that choice yourself and or to stay at home because you're not ready yet. Um, I'm watching on social media, I'm watching in other churches where there's this sort of, I think, an unhealthy dialogue and maybe some unhealthy judgments that are taking place on churches that are starting services, uh, but then also some that are starting that are sort of thumbing their noses in the air at those that are not or are not ready to come back home. And, and what I want to make sure sure is, is that we walk together as a church in unity. And the greatest gift that we can give one another during this time is to practice charity, to practice a spirit of graciousness, whether we come or whether we decide to stay home and, and have a, a longer on-ramp back into church. Um, we believe that you are, are certainly smart enough and capable enough to make your own decision. We're grateful that we have the opportunity to gather again to provide that choice, uh, but we also understand that it's your choice for, for you to make, and we want you to have that freedom. Uh, personally, I, I'm going to be here, uh, but just, just by way of example, um, Haley's going to stay at home. Uh, we have uh, two uh, smaller kids, and uh, there is absolutely no way that we are able to control what they touch. Uh, we can't get them to keep their hands out of their mouths. Uh, out of their brothers and sisters' mouths and faces at times. And so we're going to sort of have a slower on-ramp back uh, with and because uh, we have little children. Uh, but when we do come back, we want to practice a posture of loving our neighbor, like Matt said. Um, we're going to encourage and, and, and highly recommend that you wear your mask uh, to be on campus and, and to be aware. Um, I had a moment this past week where I was visiting with a, a very sweet, precious saint, uh, senior adult, and we talked for about an hour and and at the end of the conversation, I just, not even thinking, I just gave him a big old hug. And I remember leaving after that conversation, I felt guilty that I had done that, just not really even considering, but not thinking about it as well. And so I want to encourage us to be very mindful next week. Um, we have had some, some moments uh, of some folks that are in close proximity that we know that have had COVID-19 and have tested positive for those things. And so we still want to do everything that we can to uh, exercise our conscience before the Lord, to make those decisions on our own, but also to be safe and to love our neighbors and to love one another uh, in this entire process. Well, um, let's turn and let's look at the book of Acts this morning, and we're going to continue where we left off last week in Acts chapter 2. Uh, if you remember, we ended with uh, the scene where the Holy Spirit comes like a roaring tornado, this violent wind, and He invades the home of where the disciples were, and they were gathered in waiting for God to fulfill the promise that he had made. Um, after the Spirit comes, they begin to speak it with tongues of fire that the text describes it in and in, in languages that, uh, that were not their own, but so that people, others could understand what was going on. Uh, we ended last week with this scene where all of these different people from a, a vast um, array of, of geography gathered, the, the nations, if you will, gather together and they begin to accuse uh, these men and women who were full of the Holy Spirit and speaking in these languages, the accusation began that they were drunk, that they were filled with wine, that that must be the only obvious explanation to this bizarre and quite peculiar behavior. 
And then what happens after that, which is our primary focus in our text today, is perhaps one of the greatest sermons outside of the Sermon on the Mount, but one of the greatest sermons in the entirety of the New Testament. And the reason why it's one of the greatest sermons in the entirety of the New Testament is not just the the form in which Peter delivers the sermon, but rather in, in a way for God to fulfill his gift of the Holy Spirit, the response of thousands of people hearing the word of God for the first time with Peter being full of the spirit of God and then responding by faith, those that were far from God coming to know Christ and they were saved. And what I'm going to do this morning, because we don't have a ton of time together to to sort of dissect the form of of Peter's sermon. Instead, I've decided to sort of go a different way, though we'll allude back to it. And what I want to do is I want to begin our reading, if we could jump all the way to verse 37 in chapter 2. And I want you to follow along with me as I read the text. and, And I want you to notice a couple of things. He says this. Now, when they heard Peter's sermon that he just delivered, it says that they were cut to the heart. That's some striking language that that Luke uses to describe this instance. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? We, We are cut. Something has happened that we're watching and seeing this for the first time. And so in verse 38, it says, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Every single one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise has been given for you and for your children and those, notice what he says, who are far off, those who are far from God, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and he continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word, they were then therefore baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. What an incredible response to a very simplistic, but a very calculated sermon given by Peter. Three thousand souls were saved. Now I find it interesting from the very beginning that Peter was the one that delivered this sermon. You see, it wasn't too long ago that that Peter would have been perhaps the last guy that we would have ever have chosen to receive the benefit and the blessing of being used by God in such a powerful way to see over 3,000 people saved. In fact, if you were to to pick a lineup of all the disciples or the apostles that you would have picked to pick this sermon, I, I promise you, Peter would have been one of the last ones that you would have chosen. And isn't it interesting that in God's sovereignty and His grace, that He chose the, the guy who had, had sort of fallen off the wagon, so to speak. He, he chose uh, he chosen the, the least of these, the, the most unsuspecting disciple to deliver this sermon that really inaugurates the church age that, that we even currently live in. You know, I can remember back in my own life, maybe you can think back to, to your own life, when, when you saw, whether it be the Lord or a teacher or a coach, give an advantage in some way or, or show favor to someone to whom you knew didn't deserve it. And you can remember sort of maybe how that made you feel and, and maybe the, the longing for justice or the truth to be told. And maybe that truth was never told and maybe justice was never received. Yet for some reason in God's sovereignty, He uses the man who denies Christ three times, who acts hastily, and yet God in His graciousness calls that man to begin what a movement that was started with Jesus that that was going to be felt all the way into 2020. That He inaugurates this, this age and this time in which now the Spirit of God indwells in within us and resides within us. He chose Peter to begin all of those things. But what I want to do this morning is I want to focus in particular to the response of Peter's sermon. Now, we we know as we sort of gloss through uh, Peter's message, he does a couple of things with with uh, a masterful and and really a a brilliant sense and a a depth of the scripture. 
He begins in verse 17 and he begins to recall the prophecy in Joel. And and just very quickly, it says this in verse 17. In the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I'm going to pour out my spirit on all the flesh and your sons and daughters, they shall prophesy and your men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And on and on it goes. And what Peter is doing is he is recalling back the Old Testament and he is making them see the promises that God has fulfilled, that God has fulfilled the promise of the Spirit of God in this very moment that they received the Holy Spirit. But then what Peter does is that he begins to to move throughout these Old Testament prophecies and he begins to tie them into the New Testament, specifically where we see In verse 23, where he says this, that that this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God, you crucified and you killed by hands of lawless men. And so what Peter does, which I think is fundamentally uh, must exist in every sermon and every Bible lesson and every time that we teach, that there must at some point be a focus on the person and the work of Jesus. It was Charles Spurgeon who I believe famously said, no matter what you preach at some point in your sermon or in your lesson, make a beeline to the gospel. Run as as quickly as we can to the sufficiency that Christ demonstrates on the cross and and to make sure that we're connecting the dots, that that Jesus is, is risen, that he is alive and that the spirit has come and that God is still working today and that we begin to speak, not to make the scriptures relevant because they already are, but that we speak in compelling ways that show people how God is still moving and acting and responding and working in our city. And so Peter does this and and he goes on to to tie these other elements in. He he alludes to the sovereignty of God. He jumps into the Psalms and, and begins to speak to the heart motivation of the people. And all that leading to verse 37, where I want you to to see where he uses this word, they were cut to the heart. And I really think that that at the end of Acts, in in this moment, in in this uh, pericope, if you will, of, of Scripture. That one of the things that I kept asking this week as I I was studying is, why were these people, uh, why were they cut? Why did did Luke use language similar to to being pierced or or they were stabbed in the heart, that that their intellect was engaged, but their heart emotions were were tugged and because God was going after the whole person. What was it that they realized that all of a sudden they they came under conviction of sin in, in hearing these things? Well, I think that there are a couple very plausible things that that they begin to recognize and realize because of Peter's sermon. And the first thing is this, the reason why we can say that they were cut as evidence in the text and Peter tying this in to the substitutionary work of Jesus on the cross is they had begun to realize that they had made the wrong assumptions about Jesus. You see, I believe we we live in in the Bible Belt Some would even argue that uh, DFW perhaps could be the belt buckle of the Bible belt. And though our city is changing, there are many of our neighbors and and those that we work with, they've heard of the name of Jesus here in in Fort Worth, Texas. And they perhaps might believe that they they know God and and they're walking with God. All the while, perhaps they they don't have any evidence of any kind of fruit eternally. There's no fruit of the Spirit that is exhibiting in their life. There's no love and and joy and peace and patience and kindness and and goodness and gentleness and self-control that they're manifesting. And, And so they may think that they've made the proper assumptions or have the right beliefs about Jesus. But there's a whole host of people that though they may have heard the name of Jesus, they have believed incorrectly about the sufficiency of that name. Or they have misunderstood him. Or they have bought into the notion that, that I just prayed a prayer at one point in my life and, and, and I gave my life to Christ, but, but my life shows no evidence of, of any of those things now that I'm walking with God, that, that God uh, really has me, that, that I really have a, an understanding of, of who He is. These people had, had heard and seen Jesus. These people had, had, had heard the name of it, but they had made the wrong assumptions. You see, Christ, for many of them, like many of us today here, He, he was a moral philosopher. He was a decent man. He was a good guy that, that taught some really powerful things. He was a great storyteller. 
He was a brilliant connector of people, that, that he had a high IQ of emotional intelligence, that, that he understood man uh, in its entirety. They, they will recognize all of these things, all the while missing the broader point. The Christ was God. The Christ was divine, that, that Christ came on a mission to serve, not to be served, but to offer his life as a ransom for you and I to pay the penalty of our sin. And so, friend, because of that, he is more than just a moral philosopher. He is more than just a teacher. He is more than just a man. They made the wrong assumptions about Jesus. And when Peter preaches with the power of the Holy Spirit at work in his life and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in his words and his thoughts and his actions, they were cut. They were pierced. Brothers and sisters, have, have you made perhaps the wrong assumptions about Jesus as well? I believe you can go to church your whole life and still not know Christ. I believe you can go through the religious motions. I believe <clears throat> that you can love the culture of Christianity more than you love the Christ of Christianity. I believe it's possible to, to be a deacon or an elder or even a staff member and, and not truly have a personal relationship with him. I believe all those things are plausible. But it's something that only you can answer before the Lord. If you have rightly believed in him and rightly called upon his name and have assurance that you're walking with him today, for they realize they were wrong about Christ, but they also realize something else. They realize that they were too responsible for the death of Jesus. Throughout history, this text in Acts 2 has often been used as a proof text to primarily lay the blame of Jesus' death on the Pharisees and, and Judaism. But the broader truth of, of Acts 2, that what it teaches us is that it teaches us that all of us were responsible for the death of Jesus because of our sin. It was my sin Drew Erickson's sin, your sin, that crucified him and put him up on that cross. It was my failure, whether it be future or past or present, it is my sin that has separated me from my heavenly Father. Therefore, it was absolutely 100% necessary for Christ to come and to die. And we see that they began to realize that they were responsible for His death. We see this in verse 23 where we read again where he says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God where he says, You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Peter was, was also, in, in another sense, he was speaking about the global perspective of, of the reason why Christ died. You know, we have a mission here at Travis that we exist to see people far from God come to know Christ. And where we've gathered that language of, of pursuing those far from God, where I draw from that is, is here in Acts chapter 2. And I want you to notice with me in verse 39, because this is where we derive our mission statement here at Travis. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. You see, Peter understood in this moment that he was speaking to, to all the people of the world, all those that were far from him, that this message was intended to save them and to be a part of their redemption. And so it's a global perspective that Peter has in mind. But friend, it is also a very personal perspective that Peter has in mind. If you flip over to Luke chapter 22, verse 62, we see this sort of uh, uh, piercing statement that, that is characterized at the end of Peter's denial of Jesus. Jesus tells Peter, you will deny me three times. Peter's like, surely, Lord, I won't do that. And then in Luke's account, in Luke's gospel, in chapter 22, we read the account. And I just want you to notice verse 62, which is Peter's reaction to his betrayal. 
He's confronted by the Lord after denying him three times. And then before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And then Peter, after having done that and remembering those words in verse 62, it says this. And then Peter goes out and he wept bitterly. You see, Peter understood that this message was Peter speaking globally, but Peter was also speaking personally. The Bible teaches that Jesus died for our sins. It tells us in Isaiah 53 that he was wounded for our transgressions, for my sins, for the stain of my actions. Christ gave his life. Friend, this morning, I just simply want to preach at you a a simple gospel message. Have you been cut by the gospel? Have you been changed by the message that is found in God's word that Christ has died to save sinners and I am one of those sinners. Have you been cut? And if not, my my plea for you today is is to simply give your life and your heart to the Lord and and to confess and to believe by faith that God raised him up from the dead and that, that he is sufficient to save you of your sins and capable of that and to call upon his name and you'll be saved. My hope is that this morning you will see Christ as the one who is who is able to offer atonement for your sins, to offer you forgiveness of your sins. This was the message that Peter preached. It was a simple gospel message. It wasn't filled with a lot of illustrations. There was no joking at this point. There were no illustrations really at this point. He used scripture to illustrate scripture. And it was this basic message of repentance of sin. I remember the first time I ever heard of the story of of when and how Billy Graham became famous. If you were to characterize from an academic standpoint, Billy Graham's sermons over time, he, he's not necessarily known as the most technical speaker. In fact, his messages are often overly simplistic. And, 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 and sometimes from an academic standpoint, you go, man, like, like give us a little bit more. And, and not to critique Billy Graham, of course, but, um, but he preached overwhelmingly these simple messages. And you go, well, how, how was he so effective then? And, and why was that so effective? And I think part of the answer has to lie in, in, in God's sovereign hand upon a man, his, his unction, if you will, in the preaching vernacular, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit on his life, blessing the reading and the teaching and the passionate portrayal of that word to his people. And in 1949, the aging media mogul William Randolph Hearst who we don't know if he actually sat under one of Graham's uh, teachings at one of his crusades, but for whatever reason, he sends out a message to all of his editors across the country with just two simple words. And he says, Puff Graham, which they understood that to mean that, that you write about him, you talk about him, you talk about this golden boy who, who is preaching these fiery, simplistic messages and you elevate his ministry. What would explain a non-Christian doing that? Friend, the answer to that is really simple. It is the hand and the blessing of God. It's his spirit come upon uh, one of his choice servants. And, and it is said that within Billy's life that he preached the gospel to somewhere of over 200 million people. 200 million people. And I had the joy in college of being a part of one of those crusades in Dallas right towards the end uh, when he began to, to stop doing them. And I watched the hand of God and the people began to move, the people of God responding in a place and a posture of repentance. So when they were cut, they realized they were wrong about Christ, but they also realized that they were responsible for his death, that they were sinners and they had fallen short of the standard that God had given. But I want you to notice the response when they recognize that they needed to be changed. Notice their response. He says this in verse 38. And Peter said to them, therefore repent. What must you do? You must repent of your sins. You commit, you repent of of your idolatry. You you commit of, of your adultery. 
You commit of, you, you repent of, of your theft. You, you repent of your insubordination. You repent of your lack of faith. You, you repent of all of the things that would keep you from, from worshiping and pursuing Christ. Anything that is in the way that inhibits that worship, repent, change. Let God give you new purpose today. This morning, as you sit in your living room, let God breathe new life and purpose into you. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For I long for the day where we as a people continually begin to bring people far from God to know Christ, but we have to model that repentance and that forgiveness first. And so they therefore sought the forgiveness of the cross, understanding the condemnation that Christ took for them, but also listen to this, they also understood the goodness of God in a very horrific event. And this is where I want to end with you this morning. Because oftentimes when we talk about the cross, we often leave people in places of shame and condemnation. And friend, I want to tell you this, that if that's all you've heard throughout the years, that that is not the gospel in its entirety. The gospel is about coming to deal with our sin and, and coming to deal with the condemnation that, that we've brought upon ourselves because of our sin. But listen to me, forgiveness of sins is not just about feeling the condemnation of the cross, but rather it is also about receiving the goodness of God to you through it as well. The gospel leaves people with hope that we can change, that we can be different. It is the only way of everlasting change. And my prayer for you this morning is that we will allow the gospel to change us. If you don't know Christ this morning or you're far from God or you're struggling, we would love to know that. We would love for you to, to take the first step and reach out to us uh, through our website or in a comment section. We would love to visit with you about what it means to follow Christ. But friends, if you know Christ, my challenge is to you is, is what group, it may not be 3,000, it may just be one this week, or maybe it's two or three, but, but who is it in your area? If you're full of the Holy Spirit, who is it that you are pursuing to come to know Christ as you do? I cannot wait to see you next week. I really, I can't stand it. I, I, I'm so excited to gather with you. We want to come with hopeful hearts, with, with uh, hearts full of gratitude, longing to be with His people. I've heard this said throughout this pandemic. Listen, the church is not a building and, and we're going to get back to a New Testament church back in the homes. And, and I understand the sentiment of that, but I want to remind you that though the church is not a building, the church is a gathered people that come together. It is the assembly of His people. And one of the things that, that I miss so much about our church is, is that we, have, we are missing the generations that are here at Travis, the young and the old, assembling together to be together. And, and if you're coming next week, I can't wait to see you. I will try not to hug you. Uh, I will have my face mask on. We will do air high fives. Uh, maybe we'll have some, some pole extensions to handshake or whatever that looks like. I don't know. But God be with us and protect us and let us be full of hope in the gospel, for he is good in all things. Amen. Let my life be to you a symphony, singing out holy, holy. All my days, every single breath I breathe, singing out holy, holy.